Welcome to the first monthly meeting of uh, 2024, the 211th anniversary meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Dan Jackson to give a lecture on understanding the Thumbrians, cultural archaeology, and the long jury in the history of Northeast England. Dan is the author of The Northumbrians, Northeast England and Its People, A New History, which was a Sunday Time Book of the Year 2019. He holds a PhD from Northumbria University and his thesis was on popular opposition to Irish home rule in Edwardian Britain, which was published by Liverpool University Press in 2009. He has written for the New Statesman, Prospect, History Today and Unheard. He's appeared as a, an expert guest on BBC's Who Do You Think You Are? Radio for Start the Week and the Rest is History pod podcast. He was a founder member of the Heritage Lottery funded uh, Northumbria World War I commemoration project, which was given the Queen's Award for voluntary service in 2018. After an 18-year career in local public services, he's now a director in the North East Regional NHS and was recently appointed as a trustee and vice chair of Beamish Museum. And if anyone's interested, he says he tweets as at Northumbriana. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for this very kind invitation to come and speak to you this evening. It's a real treat to be at what is such an august and venerable institution. And I'll be touching on some of the themes probably that led to the creation of institutions like this in Newcastle or 200 and odd years ago. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, is give you a sketch of, of some thoughts I'd had about the perseverance of certain cultural traits in the northeast of England. Um, a concept that was first introduced to me up, which by Bill Lancaster, who I'm sure many people in this room will know. But Bill supervised my PhD for a while, and he introduced me to the the this concept of cultural archaeology, trying to understand how and why places are the way they are. And I've always been very interested in what makes the northeast of England so distinctive. And that's what I wrote the book about and what I tried to explore in the book. And taking a cultural archaeological approach, I think the answer lies in the deep past of this region. And to, to understand why we are the way we are, you need to dig down and through the, those strata of history. Because I don't know about you, but you spent time away at university and so on and with work and different things. And people in the rest of the country have strong opinions about the Northeast in a way that they don't necessarily have about other regions or large cities in this country. So if you say someone from London, for example, what do you think about people from Nottingham? They might not give you an answer. They probably wouldn't. Or what do you think about people from Bristol? You know, ancient English towns with strong identities and so on, but they don't wouldn't necessarily give you a view. But if you said... What are people from Newcastle like? They would probably give you an answer. And it might be a caricatural answer, largely is, about uh, extroversion and sociability and ragginess and concepts like that. And they may have a grain of truth to them. And I'm using Newcastle as a kind of shorthand, perhaps I shouldn't, but for the, for the wider Northeast here. But th there, is a str there are, are strong views and there is a, there's an argument to be made that we are, in, in some respects, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to say it. We are the most distinctive English region for the re for the reasons I'm going to sketch out this evening. And so when I uh, wrote the book, oh, hang on, clicker's not working. First malfunction. Hang on, I'll try the cursor. That often works. Oh no, is it still stuck on that notes um, thing, Katie? Oh, it's um. You maybe click. Should I just come off that? Yeah, okay, I can sorry, do that. I, yeah, that's I fine. Don't know why this is on my... sorry about that. No, no problem. So I use the term terminology Northumbrians to describe the people of the Northeast. And I know that's slightly anachronistic, but I was looking for an inclusive term because I think much study of the Northeast of England gets bogged down quickly in who qualifies to be a Geordie. And I, I think it's quite a tedious debate. For the, for the record, I think it's a matter of self-identification. If you want to call yourself that, then that's absolutely fine. Typically, those people who call themselves Geordies came from the Northumberland and 
Durham Coalfield, which is a fact that's often lost. In fact, I know people from Sunderland who can recall being described as Geordies uh, re- up until relatively recently. But that need not detain us, because <laughs> I think it is quite a tedious debate. Um, and I was looking for an, in- an inclusive term that brought everyone together, because I think there are commonalities across every all the places in this geography. Uh, there is more that unites us than divides us and football rivalries and so on and get it can obscure that a lot of the time. But Northumbrians also allows us to connect ourselves to the deep past, to possibly that first golden age of Northumbria, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. And this is an unusually well-defined region in English terms. It was described in the Middle Ages as the land between the brine and the high ground and the fresh stream water. So it's unusually well-defined topographically, you know, between the North Sea, those ranges of hills, the Tweed and the Tees, really important rivers in, in the history of these islands. And um, that's the territory that I'm particularly interested in. There's the clipper card. And actually, I don't think that um, the geography of these islands, and topography and so on, and geology for that matter, are well enough understood when we consider the history of these islands. I'm pleased to see Professor John Tomney here. and He's really influenced my thinking on this and how this, the uh, um, natural boundaries are really important when it comes to shaping identities. And this is a map of England. And I think it's it's worth remembering how difficult it was to, to travel across, particularly to travel from south to north. And the, the, that straggly blue line that basically links the Mersey to the Humber, it wasn't just the rivers that were difficult to, to get across. There was the mosses of South Lancashire near the Mersey, moss meaning marsh. Then you had the Peak District. Then you had the River Trent, the Isle of Axholm and so on. And they were difficult to tra- traverse. And it meant that the place in the furthest north northern corner of England, north of there, was even harder to get to for, for many years until we became much better connected. Um, but uh, this is sh- this these kind of topographical questions and geological questions as well have really shaped how we ha- our understanding of how this island works, actually, because, of course, the Romans described that area south of roughly that line as Britannia Superior, of course, and it's outrageous what they called the the zone north of that line, I won't even say it, but um, that has shaped our understanding of a rich and fertile south, which was largely true and well-connected south with a poor and largely impoverished north for a very long time. So when it comes to questions of identity as well, there are other things crowd in. Um, <clears throat> if if you would ask the man, on the man or woman on the street about, well, what might explain northeastern Geordie, Northumbrian distinctiveness, they might say, well, it's because we're all Vikings. Well, that's not strictly true, though. Um, it, I, I always enjoy this that this map of the the Dane law in the ninth century, because the Vikings certainly raided the northeast Northumberland and Durham coast, as it were. Uh, but they didn't really settle north of the River Tees, and you see really good evidence of that in place names. You know, all those by ending Viking places and Thorps and so on tend to stop at the the River Tees, north of that line, north of there. And you'll see there that kind of rump of uh, Anglo-Saxon Northumbria. Um, you tend to see um, Anglo-Saxon place names more prominently displayed on maps and so on. Backworth, Killingworth, Plawsworth and so on. Uh, they're, they're more obvious because that was a kind of Anglo-Saxon stronghold in some respects. So it might not be that we're Vikings, it's because we're Germans, as my grandmother used to say. Um, but they're obviously they're very close links between those two groups of people. But thinking about the long durée, that, that concept was introduced by French historians to say, stand back a bit from the kind of fluctuations of political history and so on, the events that happen that are, tend to get recorded in the history books. Stand back and look at the deep lying continuities of culture and everything from architecture, family patterns, agriculture, religion and so on. And I think you can spot, spot deep continuities in the Northumbrian past that still obtain to this day. And actually, I first got interested in those questions of, of um, deep history and, and how they continue to influence our culture in the Northeast through my really nerdy interest in military history, which is, it kind of occupies an odd corner of, of, um, of the historical marketplace. I love to have a spin on the old Osprey carousel in Waterstones, if there's any military historians in the room. It's kind of a bit of a nerdy 
hobby. I keep saying nerdy. I shouldn't really, but it's but it has that reputation slightly. It's you know obsessive men largely who are interested in these questions. But I was always interested in the intersection of military and cultural history. And I got particularly interested in the story of the units that were recruited in the northeast of England in the kind of modern period. And, and there are, there's the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers just before the First World War, the fifth of foot as they were once known before they were given a, uh, a county title in the 1860s. And they were one of the, had, you know, one of the hardest and most fearsome reputations of all the British Army's infantry regiments. They were known as the Shiners, so-called because they had so many black eyes on the parade ground, or the Fighting Fifth, of course, and there's still the horse race named after that, named after the regiment. <clears throat> and they embodied much of the martial prowess that the northeast of England prided, prided itself on, which in turn has very deep roots in our past as a, as a militarised frontier zone and kind of found fresh expression in the modern uh, period, in particular in the 20th century, where no one, nowhere, responded more enthusiastically to Kitchener's call for men in 1914 than Tyneside, or the wider Northeast, in fact. And no infantry regiment recruited more battalions than the Northumberland Fusiliers at 55. There, there's, there's only half that many infantry battalions in the whole British Army today. And there they are. And I've always liked the fact that uh, their uh, motto, which you see everywhere, the George of the Dragon, Quo Fata Vocant, translates into Geordie as we can wear a telt. Um, and uh, they had some some swagger about them. Kipling loved them, actually. He called them the Tyneside Tail Twisters when he came across them in the hills of the kind of northwest frontier in the 1890s and so on. So I was really interested in how they embodied some of that macho and hyper-masculine culture that I encountered and observed a lot growing up in the northeast of England. And then another thing that brought home to me, that, that deep continuity in history, and I brought an example with me, you know, they say that the Northumberland tartan, the shepherd's plaid, is the oldest uh, tartan in these islands. And when a few years ago, the um, Royal Regiment of Fusiliers returned home from a tour of Afghanistan, I think it was, and they had parades through Newcastle and Mork with Nashington and places like that, uh, I noticed that they had a piper, which is an, unique for an English regiment. And it's a Northumbrian piper, uh, which I thought was striking because it connected back to that deep border history, the camouflage and the shepherd's plaid. And it was the same tartan that was worn by the Pipers of the Tyneside Scottish Brigade uh, in the Battle of the Somme. And there's Garnet Fife, who was a coal miner from Shire Moor, and he was killed almost immediately after piping the lads over the top on the 1st of July 1916, when 1,644 Northumberland Fusiliers were killed on that day, most of them before lunchtime, in fact. So the wages of war in the Northeast were awful. And in many respects, we might get onto this later on. I don't think the Northeast has ever really recovered from the First World War. We've had a, a tough past century. We lost so many of our very best men. And just as that happened, the world economy changed as well. So we kind of double whammy really hit us hard. But the cultural impact of all this stuff, the fact that this stuff was celebrated in the Northeast for centuries, finds a really uh, uh, interesting expression. Oh, well, I, in fact, I think the Viz are, are brilliant at this. I don't know how many Viz readers there are in the room. But Viz is fantastic at lampooning this kind of Geordie macho stuff uh, really well. Do you spill my paint? There's Biffa there. And um, that's a key trait in Northeast history that, that does uh, pass down the ages. But it was geographically determined all of this because of our, the fact of us being established as a frontier zone by, by the Romans, basically, from the second century onwards. And actually, when you think about the broad sweep of Northumbrian history, the, the those martial traditions are often overlooked, actually. But if you, if you consider the fact that we were established, the Roman wall established us as a frontier zone uh, almost 2,000 years ago, then you had that period of Viking raids and so on, which had to be fought off, or possibly successfully. The, the historical record is sketchy. Then you had the harrying of the north, it's interesting, of course, that Northumberland and Durham, nothing north of the Tees really appears in the Doomsday Book. It was still that considered a separate land apart. But the harrying of the north certainly uh, had a had a catastrophic effect on the population of the, the northeast corner of, of England. Some have called it a genocide. Then you had arguably one of Europe's longest border wars between England and Scotland for the best part of 700 years or so only finally dying down with the Second Jacobite Rebellion in 1745, the last time the Wars 
what town walls of Newcastle were strengthened, of course. Um, and that, you know, that had a huge impact on the culture and economy and everything of the Northeast for those centuries, when Newcastle was basically always the mustering ground for English armies marching north. There were different patterns of land tenure in Northumberland, where in the south you were given land in return for agricultural labour. Up here you were given it in return for military service. Really decisive factors. There are no medieval domestic buildings left in Northumberland uh, because they were all burned down by the Scots. Although interestingly, it's not left much bad feeling, I always think. There's always court Scott or Northumbrian relations are usually usually always pretty cordial. But um it did leave a long lasting impact. And then the fact that the Northeast is much fought over in the English Civil War or the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. Um, <clears throat> then you have the Jacobite rebellions, as I've touched upon. So we're still the seat of Mars, it's still all happening up here. And then in the um in the 18th century. Uh, we achieved this sort of preeminence in naval warfare through through great figures like Cuthbert Collingwood and others, and Jack Crawford from Sunderland, the famous hero of the Battle of Camperdown, when naval heroes carried the banner of that Northumbrian martial tradition. Um, and of course, uh, they say that in Nelson's fleet at Trafalgar, only the Thames supplied more men than the Tyne and the Weir uh, for that battle. And then just as the Napoleonic Wars were ending, you had an almost military occupation of the coal fields. Coal is just starting to really boom at this point or a bit earlier. But that kind of Peterloo period of the kind of hard readjustment to peacetime um, led to some really serious confrontations in the northeast and pretty much a military occupation which, uh, where the army had to confront the miners. And then even when peace, fine, sustained peace finally arrives in the northeast, Guess what Tyneside starts to specialise in? The manufacture of armaments led by Lord Armstrong, the descendant of a border reaver. It's almost too perfect, isn't it? The story. And he and he saw himself in that long line of tradition from the Roman javelins and the, you know, and all that type of thing. And the hardware that was turned out by Armstrong's factory, you know, um was colossal and um maybe informed and influenced people how people thought around here about conflict resolution and so on. Certainly Armstrong had no qualms about his trade in a way that Alfred Nobel did. Armstrong was a great philanthropist, of course, but he he said, you know, I, I've got, I've got, I'm not squeamish about this at all. I'll, I'll sell this gear to anyone who can buy it, arming both sides in the American Civil War, the Chinese-Japanese War, and so on and so forth. So we became this kind of arsenal economy as building on these centuries of, of a martial tradition. And then I've mentioned the First World War and the catastrophic impact that had in terms of um, casualties, lost lives, not just on the Western Front, but at sea as well, because of the great seafaring tradition, the men lost in the merchant and Navy in particular. And then in the Second World War, when the British Army had a bit of a tough time in the first few years of the war and didn't, didn't have maybe a brilliant combat reputation, there was one unit that was highly, particularly highly thought of and, and saw action everywhere, basically from Dunkirk to Normandy, and everywhere in between. And that was the 50th Northumbrian Division. And the spear point of the 50th Division, who wore the TT on their shoulder, which stood for Tyne Tees, uh, were three battalions of the Gator of the um, Durham Light Infantry. Another one of those famous county regiments from the Northeast. And I think it was the 8th or 9th Battalion were known as the Gateshead Gurkhas because they were so had such a fearsome reputation. Now, isn't that interesting? That, you know, these, these lads were the last ones off the beach at Dunkirk. At yeah. Dunkirk, then the first one's back on at Normandy four years later. That fits really nicely into that long sweep of history. But the thing is, other than some kind of post-imperial escapades like Aden's back in the news, isn't it? And the Northumberland Fusiliers had a tough time there in 1967. But all of the things that used to define the northeast of England as this arsenal mustering ground, militarised zone, are kind of gone unless unless Scotland votes for independence at some point in the future and the border reavers ride again, you know, um, it's hard to see how we'll re ever recapture that part of our story, but the cultural half-life of all that lives on through some of the behaviours that we sometimes see in the Northeast. The other decisive factor, I think, in our story, I've talked about the, the fact that we're a militarised frontier zone, but let's consider what was under our feet. And this stuff, it's kind of slipping from our consciousness. I know we're in the Mining Institute, basically, and we're surrounded by these, the, these former presidents and so on. But it's funny how this thing, the coal, how it completely dominated 
the northeast of England and was the source of its uh, resurgence as an important part of this country from arguably the 1500s even and for the next 300 or so years was coal. That's just near St Mary's Lighthouse actually. It's I think it's the high main seam. It's still peeking out under the cliffs at Whitley Bay. So there's a lot of it still down there but it was so decisive in our story and again had a really important impact on our culture. And I grew up nearby in a pit village called New Hartley which you may have heard of. It became famous in 1862 because of its horrible mining disaster where 204 men and boys were killed, slowly suffocated to death when the beam engine snapped and blocked the shaft and the law was changed and so on. But that story loomed large in my early life, as did, quite literally, Blythe Power Station. Dominated the landscape. In fact, we were taken on school trips there to say, look, you could work here in future. How exciting is this? My parents even used to say to me at bedtime, say night-night power station. As if I was a you know a hero in a Soviet propaganda film or something. Um, this is what you could aspire to. Now it's all gone. And there was a brief glimmer of hope where they thought they were going to build a battery plant there. So that interesting narrative arc for the Northeast of kind of carbonizing the world to decarbonizing through renewable technologies and so on, if you if batteries are renewable, discuss. But it's all gone and it's slipping, it's slipping fast. I don't know about you, though, but I'm so pleased to be involved with Beamish. But if you go there and you smell the coal fires, instant Proustian, like, wow, I'm back in Seton Delaville in 1985 or whatever. It's incredible that that used to be, you know, ubiquitous, that smell. You don't barely smell it these days. And my, my own family story, like so many people probably in this room as well, shaped the, uh, my understanding of Northumbrian culture and the place of mining within it. This is my great grandfather, who was an Irishman called Paddy McCormack, who walked here from County Mayo in uh, about 1905. And there he is. He's, he's the embodiment of so many interesting features of the, uh, the mining tradition, the, the heroes of labour, the, you know, the, uh, the aristocracy of labour, as some people described it. And there's a great video on YouTube of Richard Burton talking about his father. He was a Welsh miner, but the same thing applied about their pride and swagger and how well paid and well dressed they were. They knew they were the elite of the working class. And if you're a face worker in particular, if you're hewing coal like Paddy used to, and you can see him, he looks athletic, doesn't he? And he's got the coal mining gear on the duds as they were called to allow that freedom of movement underground. And he was a bare knuckle boxer as well in his spare time. So these were the elite of the elite. And it really interested me that culture that grew up around coal mining, largely through what my grandfather told me, Ken Lawton from Blythe, you'd be so pleased that, I, that, I, that I'm here today. Um, he, was a, he was a coal miner for 40 odd years, retired in the mid 80s, and he filled my stories of the romance of coal mining. A few people have said to me since the book came out, I said, mind, you've got to be careful not to romanticise that world. And I'll go, yes, I agree. Problem is the miners romanticised it themselves. They did. He, he told me romantic stories about what life was like as a coal miner how thrilling and exciting it was, how satisfying the work was. It was dangerous and backbreaking in many respects, but it was also thrilling, satisfying, and the levels of camaraderie were just off the scale. They would die for each other. And then when he told me stories about when him and his mara, Tommy Rutherford, who worked at Bates Pit at Blythe, which was a wet pit, i.e. it went out under the North Sea. How terrifying is that? And the water used to come in, <laughs> sea water. Um, him and Tommy knocked through and discovered a quartz-lined cavern under the North Sea, the size of a cathedral, he said to me. Don't know if that's true or not, but I've still got that lump of quartz that got him on the front of the coal news. So that Stakhanovite tradition in the Northeast of labour, with a capital L in many respects, was so decisive. And the culture of graft that you still hear about, hard graft is much celebrated. The worst thing you could possibly say about anyone was they didn't pull the weight. And there was much judgment about that. He's never done a bloody hands turn, that kind of thing. That was like the worst insult you could possibly say about people in those communities. And communities like New Hartley, where I grew up, and that was the street, actually, there's my mother there and she, um, in the 50s. And that's Melton Terrace in New Hartley, where she was born. Um, that could be anywhere, really, couldn't it? It could be anywhere between Amble, say, and Bishop Auckland. They all look like that. And that shared experience and shared expectations, because everyone was in the same boat, largely. I, I also think it's been dis decisive 
in our story, because unlike other parts of the country, you know, like the famously said of Birmingham, Birmingham's the city of a thousand trades. The Northeast wasn't really, unless you, you divide up the, the, the different kind of skilled professions within certain industries. But, you know, in about 1910, I think the stats are something like 40 or 50 percent of all the adult working age males were coal miners. It's just extraordinary proportion of people doing the same thing and people had the same experiences uh, of life. And the female side of that story is sometimes overlooked because, of course, coal mining was relatively well paid. I remember Bill Lancaster arguing that, that Northumbrian miners were probably the highest paid proletarians anywhere outside the USA by the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. And they were so well paid that they supported their family. And it was a badge of honor that a Pittman's wife did not go out to do paid work because they had enough to do in the house. She basically, you know, keeping the range going and, and being up at all hours to, to literally wash and feed and shovel calories into the miners. I think the relationship was almost like a groom to a horse a lot of the time in the in the coal fields. And uh, it was a badge of honor, even for my grandfather, who was a progressive in his politics in many ways, but he would not have his wife go out even when she had the opportunity to. So it was a very patriarchal world with very strictly uh, strict gender demarcations of, of uh, very strictly gendered worlds of work, which is different, really, to places like Lancashire and Yorkshire, where men and women did work alongside each other in the cotton mill mills and so on. It wasn't the same up here. It was very, very patriarchal. And the other thing I'll say about this world as well was the surveillance culture. Um, Pitt Village world was a wonderful place to grow up. So safe and, you know, everyone looked out for one another. Doors always open, all that business. And, I, and I'm basically, I grew up in the 80s, so I only saw the glowing embers of that world, really. But there was the surveillance thing, the neck, the twitching neck curtain, everyone knowing each other's business. In fact, I was always told by my mother and grandmother never let anyone know your business and i think well that's what you spend your time talking about other people's <laughs> business okay but i won't then i'll keep well you know because that was the currency in places like that and some people loved it and thrived on it other people found it just ridiculously claustrophobic and couldn't wait to leave and actually professor john gray is really interested on this you know the, the eminent prof uh, political philosopher from the lsc in oxford and so on he's was on Desert Island Discs recently, and he was talking about that world in South Shields, where he grew up, shipyard community, very similar. And he said a lot of people in South Shields, you know, had the opportunity to get out and join the Merchant Navy in particular and leave those places uh, behind. But it was, he says, it wasn't a cliche. That world really existed of, you know, very tight-knit communities. And those tight-knit communities were extraordinary, extraordinarily sociable. This is the place where I first ever bought a pint of beer, that uh, horrible stuff called McEwen's Best Scotch. Um, I wouldn't wash my bike with it now, but it's uh, it's about three three point two or three percent, so it's good training beer. As someone <laughs> explained to me once. But that Seaton Terrace Working Men's Club, which was built just before the First World War in in Seaton Delville, isn't it magnificent? Though you know, look at the ambition of what the miners could do themselves just through their own subscriptions. We're going to build a club for ourselves, an institute, and there's going to be a reading room and a billiard room and a concert hall. And we're going to get every daily newspaper. It's not just going to be a beer shop, although that is really important. Don't get me wrong. We're going to get our subsidized beer. Um, but that ambition as embodied in, in a club was so central that uh, social infrastructure, I think John's called it before, um, really important and in, in the, in the center of most communities. So all of those experiences helped to uh, shape my what I set out in the book about what makes the Northeast distinctive and what are the key characteristics. So there was that that martial strain, actually, in the First World War in particular, where all those traits that were so handy in industrial contexts transferred very naturally to the battlefield. And that's really neatly illustrated by the, what I think is the greatest First World War or any war memorial in this country, which is the response 1914 at the Haymarket, which you pass, you'll all pass very often, but it shows, you know, men still joining up in their working gear and so on. And that big streak of sentimentality in the Northeast, you know, the, the, the wife and uh, saying goodbye to her husband, the bands and all that sort of thing. Because in a world that was dangerous, there was a play, there was inevitably sentimentality about, about things like that. So that was a key, key strain, the martial tradition. Then you've got the culture of traditions of enlightenment. And I've got a chapter in the book called Northumbrian 
enlightenment because Scotland tends to get the plaudits. But around the same period, I think that you could argue there was a Northumbrian enlightenment and it, it, it gave us all the great inventors that I'll touch on later on. But it wasn't just an elite project. You know, my grandfather, who was so influential in my life, was a great autodidact, maybe one of the last generation of autodidacts, you know, someone who listened to Radio 4 in the shed and, you know, did the did the crossword and was interested in ideas and read books and had a proper cultural hinterland, as well as being an ordinary working man, which I always thought was a really attractive combination and found perfect expression in the Pittman painters, for example. And my grandfather painted, although he wasn't part of the Ashington group. And he, what did he paint pictures of? of life underground and his experiences that were so important to him. And I mentioned the culture of sociability and it's, I think the, the bottom left there is the, the painting the Shipley Art Gallery of the Blade and Races, which is is basically the Northeast's national anthem, I'd say. And it's so telling that it's, it's what, what, what's the subject matter? It's about going out with your pal, getting dressed up, which is the key thing, getting dressed up, going out with your pals, getting absolutely lashed. Um, that's the absolute cornerstone of uh, Northumbrian culture, which I'll come on to. And then how that found political, ex all of these traits found political expression, certainly in uh, an enthusiasm for socialism, which manifested itself in, you know, largely in the 20th century, largely that kind of the dominance of the Labour Party. But it was a particularly conservative, I'd argue, type of uh, Labour politics that dominated in the North, which is sometimes overlooked for reasons which I'll, which I'll come on to. So I thought it's more interesting to tell a story based around some of the key themes of our culture and history than just another straight chronological telling, as important as that is. Um, but just to dwell a bit again on the, on the Enlightenment stuff, which emerged from that kind of the chance that we had so much of that really valuable commodity under our feet and which turned Newcastle in particular in the 18th century into the sort of Dallas and Dubai, Dallas or Dubai of George and England, because it controlled that really vital commodity. You know, London wouldn't be the big smoke without Newcastle coal, as it was called at the time. And the Newcastle Parliament setting the prices of coal were a thorn in the side of the city of London. But, you know, that we had stuff that the capital wanted, and it meant that the North places like Newcastle were unusually well connected to the capital compared to other provincial towns and cities because of the coal trade, because of that conveyor belt of boats going up and down the East Coast, which meant we were kept well in touch with the latest fashion and consumer durables and, and books and ideas and all the rest of it. And a neat illustration of what that was like is, this is the Tomlinson Library that you, you may have noticed stuck on the side of St. Nicholas's Cathedral, which was built to accommodate the library of a clergyman who left all these books to the, the town. And so it's it's argued that it's Newcastle's first neoclassical building. But that that's that kind of Enlightenment 18th century world that's emerging on the back of the coal trade. And also because the coal trade um kind of came from the ground on which that that you know, the ground on which we stood there almost inevitably became a real fascination with the natural world in the northeast of England as the source of its wealth. And I always thought it's interesting that Newcastle gets a natural history museum decades before it gets an art gallery. So the obsession with science in the northeast is really telling. Uh, science in the natural world, and there's artistic expressions of that. I mean, this, this is the famous Chilling and Bull by uh, Thomas Buick, and Simon Sharma, I think, has called it the greatest icon of uh, British natural history and it's telling that uh, someone like Buick you know inhabited that world was so obsessed uh with nature in so many respects as was and I'm just just sketching out some of the key, key figures who start to emerge from this enlightenment world someone like capability brown of course who you know transformed how we understand the landscape and he was just a shepherd's boy from up in the hills of Northumberland or Cuthbert Collingwood himself who was an extraordinarily learned man. He was a very humane and liberal figure, really. He wasn't a ha he hated flogging his men. He was he was much loved for his uh uh kind of his management approach, I, I guess you'd say. But remember that the famous story of um when George III is reading the dispatches after the Battle of Trafalgar, which had been written by Collingwood, and the king is repeat repeatedly repeatedly said to his aide, Where did the ship's captain write, learn to write such fine English? <laughs> 
And he said, ah, yes, he went to the Royal Grammar School in Newcastle, whether that's true or not. But the story is told because he's Lord Chancellor at the time, John Scott, first Earl of Eldon, also went to the Royal Grammar School, of course. So there's really influential elite figures emerging from Tyneside in this period. And I mean, it's neatly illustrated, is it not, by, by, the, by the plaque on the wall next door. It's an embarrassment of riches, really, that the people who emerged from the 19th century world um, of um, Stevenson, Armstrong, Swan, Parsons, and so on. And then you've got figures like Swan. His plaque on Pilgrim Street will re-emerge soon, I hope. Fiat Lux, let there be light, as it says on the plaque. Obviously, Enlightenment figure. And then my favourite of all, Bottom right, this is a memorial from the railwaymen of Italy to Giorgio Stevenson. <laughs> what a man. Self-taught and usually Ill illiterate, disp despite the, well, as a young man, or as a teenager, before teaching himself to read, because it was actually one of the most literate parts of, of the country at that time. Unless you think, as often is the case, that this is a very male-dominated story, which it can be if you're not careful, Let's not forget the amazing women who emerged from this world, like Gertrude Bell, for example, the kind of Laura Croft of Edwardian England, uh, who kind of travelled, explored the Middle East <laughs> solo. And she's the granddaughter of Sir Isaac Lothian Bell, one of the great Victorian iron masters on the Tyne and the Tees. Um, but there are other figures as well, like Josephine Butler or uh, Emma Davies and other ca characters like that that emerged from this world at the same time. But... The tragedy of it all is, I think anyway, that you know, a few years ago, we were graced with the presence of the rocket, that, that thing that was built at Fourth Banks that absolutely transformed the world. And we were allowed it back for a few weeks or whatever it was. And there's the rocket uh, next to the Turbinia, those two great innovations that you know, transformed the world, as I said. And uh, the, in many respects, they're the, with the Lindisfarne Gospels, these are basically the Geordie Elgin marbles, I think, and they should be returned to us, but that's just my opinion. But that domination by the capital is, is a key strand in our story. But if I was to sum up what made the culture of the North East so distinctive, that intense sociability, the hedonism, um, the preference to work in teams, um, and so on, I would point to the industries that emerged in the 19th century and came to dominate this place um, almost entirely. A good illustration of that is the arms of Tynemouth Borough, which is basically North Shields, Tynemouth colour coats and so on. You still see it around the place. The three kings, who, the, the crowns denote the three kings who are buried on the headland, um, Anglo-Saxon, Scottish kings. But the, the two industries are, are interesting because, of course, coal mining, extraordinarily dangerous. Um, and I think the stats show that between 1850 and 1950, about 100,000 British coal miners were killed at work, many thousands more horribly maimed and disabled and so on. But actually, for a long time in the 19th century, seafaring was even more dangerous than coal mining until Plimsoll's reform started to take hold in the later part of the century. Uh, a horrific casualty rate, often within sight of the shore. So it's no coincidence that the first, the first life brigade was founded in the world in Tynemouth in 1864. And what did these people do who were doing relatively, what did they like to do when they had, you know, given that they had relatively highly paid jobs that were hard, dangerous and stressful? Well, they like to enjoy themselves. They like to let off steam, let their hair down. This is a painting which is in the mansion house in Newcastle of the celebrations for the coronation of King George IV on the Newcastle quayside in 1820, not long after this institution was founded, in other words. And Newcastle Corporation decided to replace uh, the water in the water pants with wine. And look what happened. <laughs> um, inevitably. And I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say we have seen, all of us seen scenes like this on the Kisa. <laughs> have we not? And Newcastle was always known as the drunkest town in England going back for centuries. It's some, I've seen some claims that Newcastle was the first town in England to brew beer as well in the kind of Anglo-Saxon period or records existing of that fact. So the history of our region has been lubricated with alcohol for a long time. And in fact, there was one punishment in the 17th century called the Newcastle cloak for habitual drunkards. You've gone too far this time, Bonnie lad, get the cloak on. So it was a barrel hollowed out that you, know, you had to wear and be paraded through the town. But those traditions of doing hard and dangerous work together led to things like the creation of 
the life first life brigades. In fact, the invention of the lifeboat itself, out of practical necessity itself, shields by wood have and great head and so on. Um, and it's a great illustration of that, of the, that great painting in the Lang, the women, where the women pulled the colour coats lifeboat to the beach at Whitley Bay so it could be launched into rough seas. And they did that to preserve the men's strength. So it's back to that kind of slightly subordinate role of women in the Northeast history, but still playing their part. But there are other expressions of that too, uh, in the fact that our tradition of trade unions is amongst the very oldest in the world. I think the oldest antecedent body of the GMB trade union is the South Shields Shipwrights Association of 1797. So it goes back a very long way, this stuff, the, the recognition that it's in our interests to combine, to enter into combinations, as it was sometimes known, to look out for each other and to um, indemnify each other against dangers and misfortunes at work and so on. So that's a really deep seated tradition in the Northeast. But it was, again, out of, born out of practical necessity because the Northeast had very early experience of industrial conflict and it had to deal with 24 carat bastards like this character here that you may recognize, uh, Charles Vane, Tempest Stewart, third Marquess of London Derry, absolute pantomime villain who presided over much of the Durham coal field in the 19th century, would turf people out of the homes at the drop of a hat, bring in strike breaking labor, crush the miners, unions, sent Tommy Hepburn into penury, um, and he was absolutely ruthless. And that had a really decisive impact, I think, on the labour traditions of the Northeast, which were, as a result, very cautious and reluctant to engage in confrontation because they'd seen where it got them in the 19th century. So instead, you have a tradition, and we've got representatives of this great place here this evening, you get the Pittman's Parliament in Durham City itself as representative of the traditions of the Durham Coalfield, for which you could read larger northeast great northern coalfield of uh, sensible, sober, conciliatory, cautious uh, trade union politics because Red Hills looks like a cross between the Houses of Parliament and a Methodist chapel. And that's that's obviously deliberate because they were the, the, the political traditions and the religious traditions were really, really strong and really influential on people like Tommy Hepburn, who I mentioned earlier, one of the great, great people in our history, then the first working class MP was Thomas Burt, of course, who was elected as a liberal in Morpeth in the 1870s, a uh, coal miner originally from North Shields. And then Peter Lee himself, who was a Methodist lay preacher. And although Joseph Stalin got uh, Stalingrad named after him, Peter Lee got Peter Lee Newtown. So, <laughs> you know, which would you prefer? But uh, really important. And they, they emerged from that, from that, from that world. And it's always telling, I think, that although you tend these days to see the more the, the banners with the more obviously socialist or even communist imagery of Karl Marx and so on, wheeled out at um, Durham Miners Gala or Gala. I never know how to pronounce that. There are different views. Actually, um, biblical devices were more common commonplace on miners' banners, particularly the good Samaritan recurs time and again. Go thou and do likewise. Or the one that's on display in uh, Stadium of Light in Sunderland, which I think is really interesting, with the quote from Isaiah, uh, come let us reason together. Let's sort this out sensibly. Let's not, you know, man the barricades here, because that will get us absolutely nowhere. And so just I'm um, heading into the final straight now, ladies and gentlemen, but just to think about the 20th century, our experience in the 20th century, I touched upon the fact that the, the First World War hit us really hard. And then the world economy shifted which is bad news for the northeast because we put all our eggs in one he very the heaviest of heavy industrial baskets and um that was that was unfortunate really in fact there's a, there's an interesting kind of path not taken just before the first world war and just slightly after it where armstrong starts to uh, experiment with manufacturing motor cars at scotswood then he says nah no future in this <laughs> let's stick <laughs> Let's stick to battleships. Uh, we'll, they'll always want them, um, which was which wasn't a smart move. So you can see that the northeast maybe could have could have potentially become a bit like you know Cowley or whatever outside Oxford or those places in the start in the south of England that really did start to boom in the interwar period. Our picture of the Depression era is really shaped by our view of the north. Actually, the south is booming. You know, London expands 
more than it more or less ever has done ever had done in its history huge growth there's some signs of what might have been with the fact that the world's first industrial estate is built at the team valley under the direction of neville chamberlain of all people in the 1930s the northeast needs to diversify in other words into lighter industries but there was one last hurrah to, in terms of showing off what we could do. And I'm always gripped by these photographs of the Northeast Coast Exhibition of 1929, which is um, you know, put on on the, on the edge of the town where an exhibition, where Exhibition Park is now. It looks like a Cecil B. DeMille film set or something. Incredible, really, that they, they did, they put this on to, to kind of say, we're still here. We're still producing this really... Uh, exciting and innovative heavy machinery <laughs> would you like to come and buy it and uh, it was a kind of expo sort of thing and it was a great hit with the paying public and it made its money back from all the subscribers who coughed up to to put on this spectacular show but it didn't shift the fundamentals of the economic picture in the northeast which continued to struggle and i'd suggest that this is our image that sticks with us of the 1930s but again it's not a riotous response to almost unspeakable poverty that had hit towns like Jarrow in the 1930s. It's still quite conciliatory, really. Let's let's march sensibly to London and ask the Prime Minister if he'll see us, uh, if he might consider possibly, you know, doing something. All the communists and so on were weeded out of this of this uh, expedition before it set off. We need we don't need to scare the horses here. We need to do this sensibly, and. Uh, it didn't have an immediate impact, but it did, I think, colour people's view when it came to the election in 1945 about how people voted, arguably. And it's after then that you start to get the things that people in the, the great northern coal field of Durham and Northumberland had long hoped for, you know, um, and that they'd been doing themselves in many respects. You know, the, the Durham Miners Association were fantastic at creating basically a proto-welfare state from the late 19th century onwards and making remarkable strides in terms of housing and sanitation and education and we welfare. I mean, aged miners' homes. This was decades before Lloyd George came up with the old age pension. The miners themselves had, recommended, had, had recognized that one of the greatest causes of poverty was old age and people weren't being looked after well enough. So, you know, the aged mine workers' cottages were a fantastic innovation and decades ahead of the time. And, you know, you see some of that hope that emerges in the world of nationalisation from the 1940s onwards as the Ellington banner closed the door on past dreariness, opened up to future brightness. And I remember my grandparents talking about, hey, when we went to the, the council house and we first got it and it had indoor plumbing and it was just miraculous. But the interesting story, I think, that emerges is, is the kind of nationalisation of those, those things was, was much longed for but it arguably had the effect of slightly emasculating the institutions of the Northeast. Because if Nye Bevan wants to hear the rattle of a bedpan and the corridors in Whitehall, what room for manoeuvre does that leave the institutions that used to provide those sorts of services in the Northeast? Uh, so progress always has certain downsides. And again, the fact that the Northeast's economy probably had a brief resurgence after in the post-war period. You know, if you ever read David Edgerton's book around... Um, uh, about that, the kind of austerity Britain. No, no, it's a different book. I'm thinking of it, David, it, what's he called? New Jerusalem. Where, David, yeah, but there's also the Edgerton book as well, where he talks about the, the Labour government was absolutely massively committed to armament and um, rearmament as part of a, as a founding member of NATO, which is great news for the Northeast's core industries. But that didn't last, really, and we've seen a slow decline of those things. And actually... If you just think about shipbuilding in particular, which was, um, I think there was something about the industries that dominated the Northeast that were so frankly spectacular and heroic in a funny sort of way. You know, building battleships like HMS Superb, there she is leaving the Tyne fort at the Battle of Jutland. One of my favorite photographs. Look at the awe from the boys looking up at it. Wow, you know, we did this, this was built here. Making stuff like that, wasn't like making jam or hats or jute bags or things like that, which important as they were to the economy, they weren't as spectacular as this. And they weren't as so, such a source of pride as they were in the Northeast building ships or winning a new coal scene. And the sense of purposefulness that, that was associated with those industries 
was one of the things that was lost as well as the the jobs that went with deindustrialization, which we've been living with for many decades now. And you see some of that in the statue of Tommy, the miner at uh, Horden in D County Durham. You might not be able to see. He's got what looks like a gunshot wound in his, where his heart should be. You know, the, it's a cliche to say the heart was pulled out of these communities, but it was really. Um, and we're still living with the consequences of that. And because I work in the NHS, I see this quite a bit. And John actually brought this, this map to my attention recently. It was a report done by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation of the top 10 local authority areas in the country uh, for antidepressant prescription levels. And that's quite a, quite a striking image, isn't it? That we've got the seven of the top 10. So for all the, the kind of the physical health impacts of the slow deindustrialization de of our region, making us in many respects the unhealthiest part of the country, possibly the unhappiest as well, which is a massive shift from that era of the blade and races and everyone having a great time and the, the hard work and hedonism thing. This is what we're left with now. and But I don't want to strike a totally pessimistic note because I think there are reasons to be optimistic because of the enduring traits, the sociability, the friendliness, which is often remarked upon, the built environment. These are all the strengths that the Northeast has. And with the formation, and I'm a natural optimist, with the formation now of a Northeast mayoral combined authority, with a package of devolution that will arguably never be enough, but it's something. And I think with the Northeast now forming its own uh, uh, political institutions, so we've got the equivalent of an Andy Burnham to speak for us, to speak for this region, and to try and turn the page on all this stuff, I think will be so important. And it's urgent work. Um, but I will just leave you with two, two final reflections. I mentioned that we used to have almost a symbiotic relationship with the capital city. We had stuff that they wanted. We don't so much anymore. And in that era, we had what you might see as embassies in the capital city. This is the Duke of Northumberland's Palazzo on just next to uh, um, Trafalgar Square. It's where Northumberland Avenue is now, if you've ever been around there. The palace is long gone. There was the Percy, like, straight-tailed Percy lion prowling the battlements. Um, but he's still doing all right. He's got Scion House and a few of the, a few of the small parts here and there. Uh, but you also had... Um, the Bishop of Durham had a palace off the Strand. You can look out for it. It's called uh, Old Durham Yard. And you walk down the Strand, you can just see it heading down towards the Thames. So the, the, the Prince Bishops of Durham, unique office in this country, had a presence in the capital. You had uh, Armstrong's head office was right opposite the Treasury, in fact. So, yeah, the, the main client, HM Government, you just walk over the road and get the bills paid. Well, one of the greatest losses of all was the great uh, coal exchange on Thames Street in the city of London, which was demolished in the early 1960s. A remarkable building, uh, which was decorated with murals of the Tyne and the Weir, um, but it's lost to us now. Uh, but as someone once pointed out to me, all we've got to show for it now is the fact that there's a branch of Greggs in Westminster Tube Station. Which is quite a sad thought, um, but it's better than nothing. Um, so I'll just leave you with this image. This is, um, 1929 wasn't the first great exhibition took place in the town more because there was one in 1887 for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. The Royal, what was it called again? The Royal Jubilee Exhibition. It was a similar sort of thing. It was a showcase local industries and agricultural products and, and so on. And because of the confidence of that era and the people who lived in it, as part of it, thought, why don't we just build a one-to-one -one scale replica of the old medieval Tyne Bridge? You know, just amazing ambition. And they pulled it off and it stood until the 1930s. It's a shame, really. It was over the lake. The lake's still there. But that was a replica of the old Tyne Bridge that had been swept away in 1771. A remarkable structure. Um, but for the opening of the exhibition, a local banker called Thomas Hodgkin was invited to compose an ode uh, to mark the occasion. And I'll just leave you with these reflections because I think they give us much food for thought. And the, the, the poem was called Upon a Bleak Northumbrian Moor, in other words, the town moor itself. Behold a palace raised, behold it filled with all that fingers fashion deftly skilled, with all that strongest fibred brains have willed, when they, like nature's self, vowed to build structures that shall for centuries endure. How came these marvels hither? By what power have all been gathered in the selfsame hour upon a bleak Northumbrian moor? Why should both East and West forever pour the willing tribute of their golden store in ceaseless tide upon thy storm-swept shore? <laughs>
Deep lies the answer. Endless is the chain that binds the far off ages with today. So thank you very much for listening.